Let's get to our study. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Again, we go verse by verse through our Apostle Paul's book of 1 Corinthians. And that's the way God desires for us to uh, learn his word, every word of God. So my job is to go verse by verse through Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon in particular, also supplementing it and rightly dividing it from other parts of Scripture, which we will do today, as we do each week. But this is a part of the Scripture where the Apostle Paul is dealing with uh, the nation of Israel and how, how we can see God's attitude towards sin. We're to learn, as we read the Old Testament or the prophetic books, whether it's old or new, we can learn from them, how God dealt with them, what he feels about sin. He doesn't judge us the same way he does them instantly, and he doesn't take away our salvation. With them, they didn't have salvation as a present possession, so they had to endure to the end in works. God doesn't do that with us. Where we suffer, as it were, is at the judgment seat of Christ as far as reward. But God's attitude towards sin is the same from Genesis through Revelation, okay? Uh, look at verse 11. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Now all these things, and the things we've go already gone over in the, in the previous uh, 10 verses, now all these things happen unto them, that's Israel, for in samples. So it was, it was a sample of the whole. What God did to these individual Hebrews was to teach the other Hebrews not to provoke God. Uh, we'll see more about that in a minute. And they are written for our admonition. Now that word admonition, remember what we said. Let me get my notes out here so I can review this from last week. Admonition is a gentle or friendly reproof. It's wise counsel warning against a fault or so forth, okay? And that's what God is doing through Paul. He's given us a gentle reproof, or particularly the Corinthians who were into idol worshiping and stuff. He's trying to remind them, don't be like Israel. Don't fall under the wrath of God. And when he's talking about the wrath of God, the judgment, particularly at the judgment seat of Christ, okay? They were going to lose reward if they continued on. That's what he means by our admonition. Now look at the end of verse 11. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. That's just a way that Paul is talking about as far as what God's doing in the dispensation of grace, God is now fulfilling his, his eternal purpose. Let me show you something. Go with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter number 1. Go forward to, to Paul's book of Ephesians. When he says, upon whom the ends of the world are come, God is letting us know that he's almost done with his plan and purpose for mankind uh, uh, in this world. It, what he's almost finished with what he's doing to teach man about the Lord. He's going to then now bring a new world order. So when he says, upon whom the ends of the world will come, God is now soon going to bring a new world order where Jesus Christ is the head of both heaven and earth. Let me show you that. Go to Ephesians chapter number 1. Paul says in verse number 9. Ephesians 1 verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, God has an eternal will, and now through Paul, God has now revealed it. Here we go. According to his good pleasure, verse 9, which he has purposed in himself. This is something God desires to do. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, when this dispensation of grace ends, the next dispensation, or what God's going to do, he's going to have a new dispensation. Notice what he's going to do there. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, the fullness of times, the end of the world to come, the time is being fulfilled and so forth. He's going to do something with Jesus Christ. Here we go. He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. What begins the dispensation of fullness of times is the rapture. Paul calls it 2 Thessalonians 2. He says, our gathering together unto him. Jesus Christ, our Lord, is going to come back. He's going to gather the body, and that will begin the dispensation of the fullness of times. He's going to He's going to reconcile the heavens to himself through us. Then, after that, the judgment seat, the presentation, the coronation of Jesus Christ as king of heaven, that glorification we were talking about earlier, Jim, that's where that glorification is going to be coronated king, but also those who are joint heirs will be glorified together with him, those who suffered in the mystery, if you stay faithful to his coming or your death. Notice here, both verse 10, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Jesus Christ our Lord will come back to this earth and, and through the nation of Israel be glorified amongst the Gentiles, okay? So that's the plan of Almighty God. That thing is coming to an end. Paul didn't realize it was going to go so long, but as far as his mind, 
the, the coming of the Lord was imminent. It was, it was at hand. That's what he's talking about. In fact, go to 1 Thessalonians. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Paul thought that the Lord would return in his lifetime. Notice, notice when he talks about the, the return of the Lord, he, he thinks he's going to be a part of that. It's interesting. God has just been in long suffering. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse number 17. Notice he says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay? Over in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said the same thing. He, he saw himself as being changed. We shall all be changed. We shall not all sleep. We'll be changed. We'll get that new body. As far as Paul was concerned, that could have happened in his lifetime. Okay? God just extended it for a period of time for his own purpose. Go back to, uh, go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 10 now. 1 Corinthians 10. So when he talks about the ends of the world are come, um, there's a lot of talk about end times, right? End times, the study of end times, eschatology, all this fancy word, uh, Armageddon, uh, you know, all that stuff with ISIS in the Middle East, and they're saying they're cutting off heads to bring the, the Mahdi, that's the, that's the uh, Islamic Messiah, and ISIS or Jesus. They're doing it trying to cause the end times to happen. Well, they're going to get it. Uh, Iran's... They want to they get nuclear bombs to, 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 to set off Armageddon, set off the end times. Well, that, that's the sense of what's going on. We are in the end days. Paul, Paul says here, we're in the end times of, 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 of the plan of Almighty God before Jesus Christ returns. That's what he's talking about. And, and if, if, if Paul thought it, how much more in our day? I, I can see all this stuff, the focus on the Middle East and Israel and ISIS and all the things they're doing, what they're saying. The confusion of our country not understanding their ideology is a religious thing. It's not something that you can reason. We see that because we know the scriptures. They don't. The, 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 the authorities of this world. But the Lord said, he says, men are going to be confused about these things. But we shouldn't. We, we are not to be because we know the word of God. Well, that's what's coming. Chapter 10, verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth Take heed lest he fall. We saw that that's the issue. Uh, you can never be at a point where you say, you know what, I got it all. You, you want to you wanna always deal with God with fear and trembling, having that terrible Lord, knowing that it is his word. You're going to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, okay? But when you do that, it's God working in you, both to will and to do it as good pleasure, Philippians 2. Verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. We ended with this last week. The things that come along in life to tempt you away, what the tempter, the God of this world, uh, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now work the children of disobedience, what Satan, the satanic policy of evil, it's common to man. But notice something that we have that man doesn't have, but God. God our Father is faithful. He won't allow, notice here, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. You see that? But, 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 excuse me, but will with the temptation, okay, so you're going to go through these trials and so forth. The Lord Jesus did, Israel did, we will, but notice, notice the promise. But will with the temptation also may away, uh, also make a way to escape that ye should, that ye may be able to bear it, okay? You can endure and persevere. Mm -hmm. That is, amen, that issue of escape. I looked up the, the, the definition of escape. To escape is to get away from something dangerous or unpleasant. Well, think about that. How does God keep, how does God get you away from that danger, from that unpleasant thing? Well, by giving you his spirit, number one, that's, that's a gift of God that we have his spirit. But he gives us his word and we can use the mind of Christ. That's why you build up the doctrine or develop his mind. You renew your mind with the word. Because as things come in life, you can use that, that whole arm of God we were looking at in Ephesians. You can, you can understand what, what's happening and know how to deal with it. That's why you have to rightly divide the word. You can't think about it from Israel's perspective. You have to think about it as a member of the body of Christ. That's, that means you need to understand Paul. You need to be sanctified in Pauline doctrine. Now notice what he says here. Verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly, my dearly beloved... Flee from idolatry. Now, one of the things the Corinthians were getting involved in was idolatry. 
Now, I'm going to show you that it's a little different today. Many of us don't sit before an idol and worship an idol, you know, maybe unless you're, you're Catholic. The Catholics do that a lot. They, they got idols and they speak to it, pray to them, all that stuff. But, but the average believer in Christendom doesn't do that. But idolatry can come in many ways. Uh, Paul says over in, in Romans, covetousness, which is, excuse me, Colossians, covetousness is idolatry, okay? Anything that you put before God is idolatry. Now notice what he says here. And I, excuse me, verse 15, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. You know, I was thinking about where to be wise, where to have wisdom, where to make judgments. Uh, there's an old saying, watch this, a smart man learns from his own mistakes, okay? That makes sense. A smart man will say, you know what? That didn't go well. I, I shouldn't do that. But a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. He doesn't have to go through that same thing, you know. <laughs> I, 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 it's crazy. <laughs> Jay, I can see she's one of these people. Her temperament is she got to learn the hard way. She got to go through it. Whereas some, with our personality, Chris and I, we can learn from others that way. You see, a, 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 a smart man learns from his mistakes. That's smart to learn from your own mistakes. But a wise man learns from things of others. Uh, you look at Proverbs, as David is laying out these things for his son, his sons, particularly Solomon, he, Solomon was to learn from the mistakes of his father David, of what, he's, what he says, okay? So Paul wants to, to teach us. And to be wise means to look at God's attitude, look how he dealt with Israel, look at his unpleasant reaction to their actions, and learn from it. That's why he says, I speak as to wise men. Look at verse 15. I speak as to wise men, Judge ye what I say, and we're to judge. We're to, we're, to, we're to weigh the evidence and the facts and make a righteous determination. That's, that's what it means to be a judge. Well, look at verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, and the, and the, and the word bless is happy or speak well of, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now, let me explain what's going on here. Part of the custom of the, of the Middle East at that time, when they had a meal, they would drink wine with the meal, and obviously they would have bread, they had meat and so forth, lamb and so forth, we'll get into that. But what the family did, they sat down and they broke the bread, and they poured the same out of the same cup, they, asked God, they thanked God for it, you know, blessed it, and then they ate, they partip, partook of it. Um, you even see this, you heard of the Last Supper, right? Everybody know about that. You hear about the Last Supper. Where the Lord Jesus Christ and his, well actually it was 12. Uh, Judas ended up leaving, but they, it was 12 and then Judas left to betray him. But really that Last Supper is not really the last one. <laughs> it's not the last. We're going to see that, okay? It was his last here on earth in this, in, in his human life, you know, before he died. But after his resurrection, he's going to do it again. I'm going to show you that. But really what that was, was the Jewish Passover, or the Lord's Passover. That was a Passover meal. And it wasn't just the wine and the bread. They had a lot of stuff there. They had uh, lamb and all the other things of that Seder meal. Okay, you can look up. But the point is, they had meat and stuff. Why he's focused on these two elements here, the wine and the bread, we're going to see. But that was an actual Passover meal. It was his last one with them on earth before his death, but after his resurrection, he's going to do it. He's going to, they're going to do this forever. I'll show you that. But that issue of the cup of blessing, that was a natural thing. And so when saints came together, look with me at chapter 11. Go to, go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Start at verse uh, 19. Now, you know, the Catholic Church, let me just say this. The Catholic Church has taken something that was used for good, and they have corrupted it through the whole thing with the wine and then the, the Eucharist and the bread and all that stuff, that, uh, what they call it, transubstantiation, all that stuff. They've taken a custom that was used in, in the early days of the body of Christ in particular and have corrupted it. And even other, either other parts of Christendom, of Protestants and so forth, they, they do the same thing. Let me show you what he did here with the Corinthians. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 19. For there must be also heresies among you, okay? That's going against God's word through Paul. 
that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Why does God allow heresies? So that those who of us who study to show ourselves approved unto God can be made manifest, okay? Now, look at verse 20. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. The saints would come together in one place. And how often did they did it? Once a week. Go over to, go to 1 Corinthians 16. I'm just going to show you, um, put all the pieces together. So they come together in one place. Like what we're doing right now. We're, we're coming together in one place. We don't dwell here. We just meet here, okay? Then we all go back to our homes. And you're going to see the same thing happen with them. They would do two things. They would uh, study the word of God. In their case, they would be prophesying because they had the supernatural spiritual gifts, but they would prophesy the word, okay? And they would eat, okay? It's just a custom. All right. And they did it, by the way, once, a, once, once, one, one time a week, okay? okay. And it was the first day of the week, you know, first day. Why do we meet on Sundays? Really, you can meet any time. We meet on Sundays, particularly in our culture, because that's the, that's the day that people are trained for, for, for generations to go and go to church, right? Our, our country is set up so that most people have Sundays off so that they might go and worship wherever, right? Okay? That's why we do it, because that's just the custom of our, of our culture. People, most people have that day off, and their mind says, oh, I should go to church, and we want to have a church here that they can come to. Um, they didn't call it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Moon Day, and all that stuff, Thursday and all that. Those are what the Romans came up with. The Jews called it the first day, second day, third day, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. And then that seventh day was the Sabbath, okay, the day of rest. But they didn't put names on it, Monday or Moon Day and Thursday, all that stuff. We just do it today, Sunday for the sun god. It was the first day of the week. Let me show you something. Look at, cha look at chapter 16. Look at 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Paul would take a collection, okay? Verse 2, upon the what? First day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So what they would do is between them and God, see how God prospered them financially, and take a portion of that and set it over for the Lord's work. But that was the first day of the week. Now why they did it on the first day and not any other day of the week was, well, think about it, why would the saints, the believers, customarily meet on the first day of the week. What was significant about the first day of the week? The day that the Lord resurrected, right? He rose on the third day, but it was the first day. He, he, the day of his resurrection on that calendar was the first day of the week. And so traditionally, Sunday is the first day of our weeks here in our culture. That's why we meet. That's the, this is the first day of the week. Most people think it's Monday, but really, Sunday is the first day of the week, right? And Saturday is the last. So, we meet customarily on the first day because they did, and they met because that's the day the Lord rose from the dead. You can read that in the Gospels. It was the first day of the week, okay? Calendars was, on the first. Was the Sunday the first? Sunday's on the first of the calendars, too. Right, that's why it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I mean, they didn't call it Sunday, but our Sunday on our calendars is the first day of the week, right? That's why we meet on Sundays because it is the first day of the week, and, and the custom comes from the early uh, believers they met on the first day of the week because that's the day the Lord rose from the dead. Okay. All right. So that's why we do that to this day. Okay. That's the custom. Right. Now, let's go back. <clears throat> go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, if you will. So that's when they came together. Look at verse 20. When ye come together, therefore, into one place. Now, what, now notice this. This is not to eat the Lord's Supper. They had corrupted... The whole intent of the Lord's Supper. Remember, they were to go there and study the word to get together, or get the word by prophetic word in that day. And then they were to have, share a meal. Because when you eat with someone, it, it's called communion. Uh, co, uh, com, communion. See that word communion? There's common and union. and union. Yes, mother. You have something in common that unites you. Paul says over there in 2 Thessalonians, 
with such a one know not to eat. By sitting down eating with someone, you're saying we share together. Eating is something that God has created to share one with another, okay? I'll show you that, that in a minute. But the point is, when you sit down, you ever heard the old saying of family? Well, two sayings. Uh, th th there are studies that say when families sit down and eat together, they grow closer. That's true. That's a true dynamic because God made it that way. Because you're sharing one with another. And the family of the believers were doing that as, as well. So let me show you something. This is what they did. Verse 21. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. So not only were they selfish, they weren't making sure everyone had a portion. Some of them were overindulging in the wine, where others were overindulging gluttonous in the food, and they weren't, they weren't taking care of one another. It was out of control. I thought about it. They act just like children, just like children. In fact, the whole reason I think Paul brings up it is the children of Israel in chapter 10 is because the Corinthians were so carnal like children. I'm going to show you that. When you have children, you can see this. They don't look at each other, yeah, let's just give you this, give you that. They want it all for themselves. Jada Lynn would have something. We, we'd have something as a family, you know, some food, and she likes it. She will eat till she's full, but she doesn't want you eating the rest of it. <laughs> she, instead of saying, yeah, you have it, she, we can get some more. She'd go, put it up for me for tomorrow so I can eat it. You know? So no, we, I can have some. But, but what is that? That's a five-year-old carnal mind. Well, spiritually speaking, that's how these were. They didn't want to share. They didn't want to make sure that everybody was provided for. Okay? Well, that's a shame when you're adults, particularly in, in, in Christ. Here we go. Verse 21. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. Verse 22. What? Have, now watch this. Have ye not houses to eat and drink in? So sometimes they met in house churches, but a lot of times they met in a place like this, a common room. And what he's saying is if you couldn't control yourself amongst the saints, eat at home first. Because when you come together to eat, it's more than just eating food. It's what it represents, that common union in Christ. Yeah. That's right, the fellowship. Verse, verse 22, what have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God? See that? They were despising the church of God and shame them that have not. For many of them, that would be the best meal that they had all week because there were poor saints there, okay? They didn't take this to account. Verse number, number uh, 22, what shall I say unto you? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. So Paul has to rebuke them. That's the point, okay? Now, look at verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was what? Betrayed, took bread. Now, why bring up the betrayal? Because remember I told you that Judas was there? At that Passover meal, that last supper, the one who betrayed him was there. Okay, Judas. But the Lord Jesus was very kind. Because he, he, he fed Judas the meat, the bread, the drink, the wine. Judas, this was showing his, 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 his uh, graciousness even to the man he knew would betray him. And what Paul is saying, if the Lord Jesus can do that to his enemy, we should be able to do that one with another. See, his gracious spirit even towards the one he knew who would. In fact, he says to Judas at the end, he goes, whatever you do, do it, do it quickly. Okay? Wouldn't you think that would have stopped Judas? Well, you would think. And by the way, Dorothy, you, you're thinking with the mind of Christ. That's why he said it. The Lord was trying to get Judas to repent of that, right? To, right. to not do it. Right. To give, you know, when they said, when, when people, um, when people want to uh, put hit, what do they call it, hit, I don't know, in my mind, people who want to hire hitman, okay? My mind don't go into this crazy. They want to hire hitman, right? They want to, and you get these undercover cops with cameras and, and videos and stuff. And one of the things they do when these people, they meet with the people a couple times, they say, are you sure you want to do this? Because once I go and kill the person, there's no, I can't take it back. And, and, and in every case, the police give them one opportunity. They said, now, you, you, you're right at the brink. You sure you want to do this? Like, give them that last ditch, trying to talk them out of it, right? That last free will time to, to change their mind. That's what the Lord was doing with Judas. Mm -hmm. But because of his greed, <laughs> pride, he took offense because Jesus wasn't going to go and be king, get the Romans off of him. He had to go to all these things. It made Judas uh, um, uh, 
blind and, and is spiritually blind in his heart, okay? So, there you go. It blinded him. All right. So, he took bread. Verse 24. Now, when we talk about the cup of blessing or the cup of uh, uh, the, the bread of blessing, verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he break it. You see where it says he had given thanks? If you go over and read in the Gospels, at the end he says, Father, thank you for this. He blessed it. He says, take, eat. This is my body, which is what? Broken for you. The issue of the bread is when you took that bread and you broke it into pieces, what you were doing, you were showing how the Lord Jesus' body was broken there in his passion on the cross and so forth, before the cross and after, during, during his passion. Now, that was their union. They were one in the body of Christ. This do in remembrance of me. Verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. You see that? And what that blood represents is his shed blood on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, for the remission of theirs, but for the forgiveness of ours. Remission in prophecy means God would forgive them, but they could come back, just like you go into remission for cancer, you come back. Forgiveness means they're gone forever. That's what we have, okay? And that's what that New Testament in his blood done for us. By the way, ours is by pure grace, for Israel, it was made by a covenant, the new covenant, okay? God promised them that. God never promised us Gentiles to do anything. He did it by pure grace. That's the difference. But that's what's going on when they had this, this table and so forth. We'll, we'll look at chapter 11 more when we get there, Lord willing, but let's go back to chapter 10. Look at verse number 16. The cup of blessing which we bless. So now, when Paul was with them, he, you can read it over in the book of Acts, chapter 18. He was with them for some time, and each week they do this together. They have this meal together, okay? He says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion? You see that word communion, communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the what? The body of Christ. And again, I told you, Catholicism has taken that in particular and corrupted that. What he's saying, it represents, when he says, this is my blood, the wine wasn't actually his blood, it represented his blood. That bread, his body was right there. He was holding a piece of bread, said, hey, you see this bread, it represents. It's like I show a, a, a picture of my daughter to people. I say, hey, this is my daughter. They don't think the phone is my daughter, but, you know. They say, oh, that's a, that's a picture, a representation of what your daughter looks like. And that's what he was doing with the wine and the bread. He says, look at these. This represents what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to have my body broken and my blood's going to be shed for your sins, okay? That's what he's saying. All right, let's keep going. Verse number 17, well, Paul tells us, for, for means further explanation. For we being many are what? One bread. So there's many members of the body, but we're one bread. We, we're one in Christ and one body. Why? For we are all partakers of that one bread. What is bread? Bread is something that sustains life. It's a life sustainer. It, it's, it, it gives us nourishment. And we're all nourished from the Lord Jesus. Let's keep going. Verse 18. Again, he has to show them the nation of Israel, because their children in Israel were the children of Israel. Verse 18. Behold Israel after the flesh. So look at, look at the nation of Israel. Now when Paul wrote this, Israel was still a nation that was worshiping at the temple. The temple was not destroyed until A.D. 70. Paul wrote this in, in, the, in the 50, so about 20 years before or so, okay? So the temple is still working and so forth. And many of the Corinthians were Jews who got Satan into the body, so they would know this. So here we go. Verse 18, Behold Israel after the flesh. Are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What he's saying is this. The priest there, God, when he off, when they offered those animals, they got to consume the best part of the animal. God set that aside for them. He, he provided that for the priest to eat and their family. And, and, and by partaking of those sacrifices, they were actually partaking of the actual provision of Almighty God. Watch this. Notice he says, verse 18, Behold Israel after the flesh. Are not they which eat of the sacrifices partaker of partakers of the altar? That's the holy place, okay? That's the place where, where, where the sacrifice was, was to be given. 
it's holy unto God. And that's what Paul's going to show the same thing when it comes to us saints. Watch this. Verse 19. What say I then? That the idol is anything? So as they if they're sitting, as these Gentiles sit before these idols, the idol is nothing. It's just stone or it's gold, silver, wood, whatever the idol is, okay, whatever they carve their statues out of. Verse 19, what say I then? That the idol is anything? No. Or that or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything. Look, that 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 little animal that was sacrificed, whether it's a bull or goat or lamb. The reason I don't call our children kids, because kids is in, in the Bible, a kid it's a sin offering to say, right, that's that exact, well, to God too, but it's a sin offering, okay? It's associated with a sin offering. In particular, that's why lost people call their children kids. The Bible uses children, little ones. You know, God never calls children kids. The world does that because, in essence, they're saying, "Yep, we're gonna we're gonna give our children over to Satan." Interesting. Okay, I call lost people children kids. I call saved people your children, our children, children or little ones, because I understand what kid means in Scripture. It's it's a, it's a it's an offering. It's a sin offering. Okay, let's keep going. Chapter number 10. So, verse 19. What say I then, that the idol is anything? No, the idol's nothing. It's just a piece of wood or something, or metal. Or that which is offered and sacrificed to idols is anything? No, it's just an animal. Verse 20. But I say, now watch what Paul says, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to who? Devils. Devils. The Corinthians, you guys got to understand, when they were going back to these other churches and they were sitting down eating these, these animal sacrifice to these devils, Paul is saying, hey, you guys are being partakers with, with, with devils. You guys belong to the Lord Jesus, but you're going back into that idolatrous system. Now, the way you can do that today, I mean, I don't think any of you all can go right now and go to a place where they're sacrificing animals, okay? <laughs> You might go to a butcher shop or to a grocery store. That's the post. But when, when, and I've seen this. Let's say you know the rightly by the word. When you go back to that denominational system, denominational, denominational, or religious system, it's the same thing. People, once you learn the rightly divided word, the grace message, to go back into this system, which I've seen, Kristen, I've seen people in our time together in 11 years, in my time in ministry, 19, I've seen people learn this. They think they're going to go and teach it to someone in their old church, but they end up getting taken down. That's, that's equivalent to that idolatry. You're just not eating with them, but you are eating with them spiritual food. Yeah. And so you got to be careful. That's why we were talking. Anybody can go back to that thing. you got to be aware. Let, let he who thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. Chris and I have seen people who start learning right division, the temptation has come, and they end up going back to the denominational or religious system. That's that same idolatry they're committing right there. Watch what he says here. Verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. Now, who are these devils? i got to explain this because I get this question. There's no such thing as demons, okay? A demon, that's how the, the new version, the... the Demons. That's how the other version, the corrupted versions of the, of the Bible name. A demon is just a new age. It could be a good angel, in their mind, a good spirit, or, or bad, okay? Most people think of it as bad. But in new age, it could be good, too. You know, you see the two gods, two devils sitting on people's side, one red, one white, and telling them to do good. Demons. So that, the Bible never uses that word. A devil, or also called an unclean spirit, unclean spirit. These are not angels. They're not angels. Angels are a totally different beings for the heavenly places. They go back and forth. These spirits are the disembodied spirits. They're disembodied. And it just be embodied. They came out of bodies, human bodies, or hybrid body. Disembodied spirits from the floods, okay. I say floods, period, because there was a pre-Adamic flood, and then that was the one of Genesis 6. And whatever those creatures were that were 
those giants, those hybrids of human and angels, they created these giants. And when those giants were, were killed or flooded out and so forth, if they were all human, all human spirits go back to God who gave it, the spirit of Ecclesiastes. So even a lost man, spirit gives life, it goes back to God. He's the father of spirits. But that's humanity. These, these creatures were not created by God. And so their souls, their souls of these men, they went to hell. Their bodies, you know, were buried and stuff. Now with technology, they're finding, they're finding bones of giants. Now, the, the scientific... Let me say it like this. Science falsely so-called. The scientific community is hiding this stuff. I heard that many of these bones were sent to the Smithsonian Institute, and then they disappeared. Mm -hmm. Because Smithsonian don't want to get out. One guy said he thinks they put them on a boat and they flood the th they take it out and destroy it in the sea. So when we, anyway, there's still pictures where you see these gigantic bones, okay? That's the corpses of these dudes. But... They have spirits, too. And because their spirits don't go back to God, they just roam the earth. They roam the earth. So when you see their chick Teresa on her show telling people, speaking to the dead, telling their relatives, hey, you did this, you bought them that, you said that, they said that, that ain't their dead relative. If that the dead relative was, was, was a child or something, they, they were the Lord. If they were a lost heathen or uh, an adult, they're in hell. It's called familiar spirits. These are spirits, satanic spirits, that are familiar with everybody on earth. And so she didn't open her mind to communicate with these, and these spirits are telling them stuff because they're familiar with these people. So she can look at a person and say, uh, your son or your father said this, and they go, oh yeah, you did this? Well, yeah, because the satanic spirits are telling them that. When Jesus Christ cast out devils, he did it because they love to be in human bodies. They used to inhabit bodies, so they're looking for bodies to inhabit. Number one, they want human bodies. Now, if they can't have a human body, he says they just look around. When an unclean spirit is cast out of a man, it looketh before another place. It goes through the wilderness. He's looking. He's looking. And if a human being don't allow a man, because you've got to allow the man, they'll go into animals. They just like flesh. So are they in her body? Are they in the body? Whose body? That lady Teresa. I don't watch the show, but I, 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 well, you, I don't. I don't know how much access she's given. She could just. She could just communicate with them. Oh, okay. okay. Or she, if she might allow them. I don't know. It's, you got. You got to let them in. That's why that old vampire thing with Dracula. He can't come into your house until you let him in. Yeah. <laughs> He'll stand there. You. You have to. Your free will. Let him in. God still gives us free will. But she could just be communicating with a lot of those psychics. They just communicate with those things. Oh, okay. okay. You don't have to let them in. You can talk to them. The Witch of Endor. You know Endor from uh, the Witch? Witch. Yeah. They got that from 1 Samuel, the Witch of Endor. This lady was communicating with these spirits. Saul goes over there, says, I want you to bring up Samuel. She brings up Samuel. That was real. God let that happen so that he could condemn Saul. But the point is, they're just communicating with these spirits. My point is, that's what's happening when you see psychics and all that stuff. Witches. Which all of any, anything, any of these uh, black magic and stuff, man, that, all that stuff. Chris Angel, all those guys, David Blaine, they're communicating. They're getting help from these things. There's power. There. There's, there's the, like the power of darkness. Ouija board. All that stuff, yeah. That. Yeah. It's power. It's called dark, uh, black, uh, uh, power of darkness. So spirits, because they used to have human bodies, they seek human bodies. And Jesus Christ was just, our Lord just cast them out. And remember what he says when they cried out to him? What happened? They said, can we go into the swine? You remember that? Uh -huh. They went into the swine. Interesting, there's swine in Israel. We weren't supposed to be. Anyway, wasn't. So, and then they <coughs> went into the swine, and then they were, went into the water and choked. The point is, they like bodies, okay? They're not angels. Angels are for the heavens. They go back and forth. These spirits are earthly, okay, because they were, they were human, some type of human hybrid, and because they couldn't go back to God, because God didn't create them, they just kind of flow around the earth. That's what they do, okay? That's, that's who these Gentiles are sacrificing to. They're being communicated by these devils. Let's look at it. Uh, go with me, if you will, 
1 Corinthians 10. So I kind of want you to see, because people ask, so I have something out there. That's what happened with these spirits that are roaming around, okay? And that lost people are connecting to. All right, here we go. By the way, can I say this? That's why we have a spirit in us. Two things that God has given a spirit to do. Let's say a human spirit. Number one, to connect with other spirits, okay? To connect with other spirits. Whether it's human spirits, whether it's other devils or uh, other spiritual beings like Satan. Connect with other spirits. Satan is a spirit being. But God is a spirit being too, right? When you get, so the way, the reason why I can talk, you don't see the words coming out. They're spiritual, but it goes into your human spirit through your ears and you understand, you can comprehend what I'm saying. So that's the second thing. Not only connect to other spirits, but to, but to know things. Okay? Discern. Discern. Oh, that's what you're doing right now. As I'm talking, it's going into your human spirit and you're, you're, it's a whole process that God did, but now you're understanding what I'm saying. Let me show you something. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. That's why we have spirits to connect with other spirits and to learn. Now, we're not to connect with evil spirits and learn of their ways, right. like Teresa and these other ones. We're to learn of the spirit of Almighty God and learn from other spiritual beings, like us. Look, look what Paul says. What did I tell you? Chapter 2, excuse me. Okay, oh, pardon me. Chapter 2. 1 Corinthians 2. Okay. Yeah, 15. Uh, start verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. If it wasn't for God revealing these things, we wouldn't know them. But, but God, verse 10, hath revealed them unto us how? He was doing it supernaturally, giving these mystery things to Paul and the rest of them. Now he has the word of God through Paul, the, the, the Romans through Philemon, now we can know him. Here we go. By his spirit, verse 10, for the spirit, now that's capital S, that's the spirit of God. For the spirit searcheth all things, what? Yea, the deep things of God. Verse number 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the what? The spirit of man which is in him. How can you know... How, who I am, and I know who you are. We have the same human spirit. There's some things that we can relate to. I can talk to you, and you can understand, and vice versa. Okay? You can understand emotion also. Yeah, it, it, we, we have that same makeup, right? Spiritual makeup. Okay? Here we go. That's how we know each other. Verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but who? The spirit of God. So look, because we don't have a spirit of God as human beings, God has to give us his spirit, right? And the moment we trust the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross for us, he shed his blood. The moment you believe that, the spirit of God comes and he comes and takes a bold in your spirit. Your spirit is right here in your head, right there. The pineal gland, the spirit of your mind. Where, the spirit of, where your spirit, human spirit dwells is right there. That's why you see like the uh, East Indians, they have that little dot there and stuff. Mm -hmm. That represents the third eye, oh. where, the, where you get enlightenment. Well, that's where the, your human spirit dwells. But then when you get saved, the spirit of God comes in there as well, okay? And now we have the ability to be enlightened by the things of Almighty God. Watch this. Verse number 12. Now we have received... Not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of who? Yeah. God. Why? That. Here's the purpose. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So why did God give his spirit to believers? To know. To know God. To communicate, to know, understand, discern, all those things. So that's what our human spirit, when we trust Christ, the Spirit of Almighty God comes into our human spirit. Uh, can, they, they, they dwell together, as it were. And then, so now we can not only connect with other human beings and with other spiritual beings, we now have a connection with God Almighty. And we, by the way, how to know God? Through His Word. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
Today, God is only communicating through his word, his scripture. Okay. All right. So that's why we have that spirit. But these Gentiles, go back to chapter number 10. When they would sacrifice, they sacrificed to devils. Verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrificed, they had their church service. Now, the reason I'm saying this is when you go into denominational system, Paul calls that doctrines of devils in 2 Timothy 3. Well, what I'm saying is for us today, since we don't, since our culture doesn't do the whole thing, I guess I guess you do it in Catholicism with the whole one. But anyway, even, even if you go into that system, it's with the doctrines of devils, you're communicating with devils is the point. When you go into a denominational religious system, when you give heed to that stuff, it's idolatry, you're worshiping devils and not God. That's the point. It's called doctrines of devils. If you were to take communion with the Catholics, is that the same thing? Yeah. Yeah, that's like tied yeah. tongues in. Huh? If you would have did what, the, if you did that communion with Cat, you would do exactly what these people were doing in Corinth that Paul is rebuking them for. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Don't mess around that stuff. That's what because they're they're crucifying the Lord Jesus afresh or new, like the book of Hebrews. They're constantly crucifying them. Yeah. It's bringing them to an open shame. Yeah. That's why. That's why. They meet him on the cross. Because I was just about to say that. Thank you, Gordon. The reason why you see in Catholicism... Yeah. I'm going to show you something. Sometimes, you know, you see people with uh, chain necklaces and stuff, and you see the cross, right? Mm -hmm. Or you see it, like, places. That's okay. But when they have Jesus on that, I'm going to call him Jesus because it's in his suffering as a human, and he's all, you know, bloody and beat down and just, yeah. mm, mm -hmm. and just sitting there. They're left in there. Why is that? Because that's Satan saying, yeah, I got him in this humiliation seat. Because <laughs> Jesus, not he's not suffering on that thing. He, he, he died on that cross in humiliation, but he was buried and he rose again in his glorified body. He's the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. He not, that's not how he is today. That's right. Oh, on that thing. That, that's, that's satanic policy to put him to shame. Yeah. But by going through that bread and that cup, each time they do that, they're, they're trying to bring shame to him again. No, no, no. Let me show you something. The Lord Jesus, not, he's not still on that cross suffering. He's alive. He, he's alive and well. <laughs> Amen. All right. Let's keep going. Verse 20, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that she should have fellowship with who? Yes. You think? <laughs> Go over to 2 Corinthians. He had... You know what you got to do to children? You got to keep reminding them, don't you? I crack up. Jada Lynn has taught me so much about no things. <laughs> uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. Krista and I could tell her something this moment, and within 30 seconds, we'd have to tell her the same thing again. She'd act like my wife well didn't even say nothing. That's how children's minds work. They just forget it. And so Paul has to constantly remind the carnal Corinthians about stuff. He just told them, don't have sacrifice with devils. They do it again later. Let's look at it. Chapter 6. I think I have a child's mind. Well, that's... <laughs> we all do. I'm reverting back. Right. I mean, I deal with <laughs> seniors every day. Their minds are like that because of old, old age. Yeah. That's not what he's talking about. Okay. Thanks for the reminder. God, God takes special care for children and for the elderly. Okay. He's talking to men, you know, you know. Yeah, so Sorry. don't worry about that, Dorothy. Okay, Sorry. that's okay. For, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with what? Unrighteousness. And what communion, common union, hath light with darkness? We're righteous in Christ. They're unrighteous. They're lost. We're the light of, 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 of the Lord. They're darkness. They're children of darkness. Verse 15. And what concord, see that issue of concord with, with the cord, hath Christ with Belial. Belial, another way of saying Satan, okay? The Lord of the flies and so forth. The Lord has nothing to do with that. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement, infidel simply means one who is not faithful. And what agreement hath the temple of God with what? Idols. Idols for you are the temple of God. Keep going. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, 
And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. This is a sanctification issue. So don't go into that denomination religious system anymore. Leave it alone. It is blasphemy against God. Okay. It's idolatry. All right, let's go back. <clears throat> go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 10. Got about 10 minutes. 1 Corinthians 10. All right. Verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. We just saw you, there's no communion. There's, they, they don't go together. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table or that place of provision and so forth. And the table of what? Devils. The Corinthians were doing both. It was crazy. All right, here we go. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Now, as we come down to the end, let me show you this issue about jealousy. Most people look at jealousy, and we've been taught that jealousy is actually a bad thing. Right? Somebody was jealous and then blah, blah, blah. But jealousy in the Bible is not presented that way. In fact, God is a jealous God. Let's look at that. Do we provoke the, the Lord to jealousy? Um, I looked up the word jealousy. It's interesting. It's To be jealous means to be intolerant to a rival or any unfaithfulness. Okay? I'll write that on the board. Jealousy. Because we are looking in the Bible and see that the Lord is jealous. Jealousy, or to be jealous, I'll just put it like that, jealousy. He causes the Jews to be jealous of grace message. Well, he did when, during Paul's, yeah. If Paul, one of the reasons Paul had the supernatural gifts that were Israel is so that the Jews could realize God was among the Gentiles through Paul. Jealousy is an intolerance. Everybody always talk about tolerance, right? Well, God's intolerant. Intolerant. <coughs> He's intolerant of... Any rivals or unfaithfulness. Okay, he's intolerant. He just don't. He don't. He don't let that stuff go. One of the Ten Commandments is that one. <laughs> the, the top one. I am the Lord, the God. You know, thou shalt worship the Lord only. He talks about thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Right? Yeah. Yeah. God don't play with that stuff. He, he's the top dog. He deserves it. He deserves it. Jealousy. Intolerant of any rivals or unfaithfulness. Let, as we end, let me show you what the Bible testifies about that when it comes to the Lord. Go back to Deuteronomy 32. Go all the way back. This is the passage that Paul is, is dealing with a lot in uh, chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. Go back to the fifth book of Moses, fifth book of your Bible. Deuteronomy 32 as we come down to end. Deuteronomy 32. And let's just, we're just going to go through a few passages and then, uh... oh, you know what? I didn't tell you guys this. So we got about five minutes. I, you remember on uh, Wednesday night, we saw the Good Samaritan yeah. and he poured into, he poured into that guy's wounds, that Jewish man's wounds, oil and wine, right? Okay. Because we're going to look at something in there. And, and I didn't get into it because I was focused on other things, but I was thinking about it. Why oil and wine? Well, these two things represent something. Jesus turned water into wine. But wine in the Bible represents joy. And that's the reason that cup of blessing had wine in it. It represents the joy of the Lord, okay? Mm. And oil, they call it oil of olive. We call it olive oil. The Bible calls it uh, oil of olive. Olive oil especially. Olive represents spiritual access. If, if, if wine represents joy, what do, you, what do you think olive oil represents? Happiness. Uh, well, joy is, is, would be happy. Peace. 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 Okay. Those two things. And when the Good Samaritan who represents the Lord Jesus Christ poured in oil and wine, that was because that was representative of him giving joy and peace. The whole reason Jesus turned water into wine there is a type of the joy that he's going to bring the nation of Israel in his kingdom. So anyway, wine represents joy, oil represents peace, okay? And, and, and the, the Holy Ghost and so forth came as a dove, peace. So the point is that's why he poured that in. The reason I brought that up, let's look at this over here. As we come down to the end, look at Deuteronomy 32 verse 16. Speaking of Israel, 
they provoked him to what? Jealousy, Jealousy with strange gods. Mm -hmm. you? With abominations provoked them, they him to anger. Jealousy, jealousy leads to anger. That's right. Oh, it does. Mm -hmm. um, it can provoke a man to kill. You know what I mean? Yep. Something, especially if, if, it's, if it's dealing with his woman or something. Okay? Hear what they did. Verse 17. They did exactly what the Gentiles did. They sacrificed unto what? Yeah. Devils. Not to God. To gods whom they knew not. To new gods that came newly up whom your fathers feared not. For time's sake, go down to verse number 21. They have moved me to jealousy which that with that which is not God, says the Lord. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. That's what your idols are. They're just vain. I will move them to jealousy. Now, Dorothy, this is what you were talking about, right? Yeah. I God says, okay, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move them to jealousies with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish what? Nation. Now, in prophecy that ends up being not the Gentiles, because he didn't say nations. In prophecy, that ended up being the nation of Israel, that little flock, okay? When Jesus came, he was getting a new, a, a new people out of Israel, a little flock. But in the mystery, he has taken what is Israel's and given it over to the Gentiles, the spiritual blessings, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how, that's Romans 11, okay? All right. So a couple more of these. Look at Exodus. Go back to Exodus chapter 20. Not only is God jealous, that's one of his names. Just <laughs> names represent it, it characterizes who you are. You know? He visits the iniquity. We don't really do this. We just come up with names in our culture. But you really, when you name your child, you're supposed to name them. Their name represents what, what, what you desire them to be. Okay? God changed Abram's name to Abraham, a father of many nations, because that's what he's going to be. God would tell people, name your son this. Name him Jesus. Why? He shall what? Save his people from their sin. Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. So we don't do that now. I guess most people don't. Some people do. But when you name a child, you're supposed to name them by faith. Isaac means laughter. Because when Abraham and Sarah had that baby, she well, when God told her she's going to have a baby, she laughed. She laughed. <laughs> so it was kind of like, yeah, I laughed. And here's the, you know, okay. All right, let's keep going. we got three minutes. Exodus chapter 20. Oh, you know what? Oh, let's, let's look down one through five, because here's the Ten Commandments. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee, up, uh, brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. What's the first one he says? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, notice he didn't say you couldn't have other gods. He just said before him. Yeah. Yeah. You can, I mean, God, God wants a Why wife to reverence. Well, <laughs> when I say God's, Loji, Paul says there's lords, many gods, many Lord. Um, a woman can look at her husband as a God, little G. If Sarah, when I say little G, he says, he's, the Lord says to Israel, doesn't it say in your scriptures, and he called ye gods? So in other words, Paul says there's God's many, Lord's many. One who is, who is worthy of reverence. Mm -hmm. So when God says, wives, re reverence or revere your husband, by the way, you can reverence as a God your father, but you just can't be above God the Father. See that? Yeah, right. mm -hmm. Men reverence their fathers. Okay? Wives their husbands, so forth. Um, so he's just saying, don't put any other person before him. Okay? That's what he's saying. All right, here we go. Or, or thing. Verse 4, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, uh, for I the Lord thy God, am a what? Jealous. A jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the, th uh, upon the, children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments and so forth. So you see, he's a jealous God. Uh, go to chapter 34, Exodus 34. Go to Exodus 34, if you will. You got 30 seconds. Exodus 34. 
And this is only a few. I, when I looked up how many times he used job, it, it was too many to even look at. So I'm just giving you kind of a taste of it. A lot of repeat. Yeah. Exodus 34, verse 14. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is what? Jealous, jealous is a jealous God. His name is jealous. His name is intolerant of any other rival or unfaithfulness. That's who we said. But that's, it's only right because he created man. We are his he creature. It. He deserves it. He deserves and he loves us enough. If you're listening today and you never had anyone love you enough to ask, if you were to die today, do you know for sure, keywords for sure, where you're going to spend eternity? I love you, but more importantly, God loves you. These saints love you. That's why we have a ministry. But more importantly, God loves you. And God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. He, he shed his precious blood on that cross. But he didn't stay on that cross. He was buried. He rose again victorious over sin and death, death and hell. And he lives in heavenly places with the Father. Well, we have that same hope. If you believe that Christ shed his blood for you and that's the only payment, God will save you this moment. He is jealous. But he's jealous because he's worthy of the worship. He shed his blood God shed his own blood. The second person of God, the Lord, he shed his blood for your sins. Why don't you trust him? If you do that, God will save you forever. You can never lose it. Now, what do you do if you're saved this moment? Continue to grow with us because the next thing is that same God who, who, who died for you is going to judge you at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll help you uh, be able to um, get a full reward. Stay out of the denominational system. Stay out of the religious system. Leave that stuff alone. Be separate. Come on out of that stuff, and we'll help you with that. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you that we can get into your word, study it each and every day, study it uh, together one with another here at our assembly. We thank you that we can, through the blessing of technology, share these same studies uh, with others by way of the Internet. Now, we know it's not the same because of the live and the fellowship and having those of like precious faith in the, in the flesh to, to, to talk to. But we are thankful that for those who don't have that, they can uh, have this, uh, this ministry, be a part of it in spirit. And so, Father, we thank you for the, the blessing of, of having uh, other brothers and sisters in Christ, other saints who stand with us through prayer, through giving, and through all the ways that, um, that show their, their love for you and, show, and for us. Um, Father, as we go forth in our Q&A, as we go forth in our day, we ask that it's... Uh, glorifying to you and edifying us. We thank you for this blessing of spending this time in your word together. In Christ's name, amen.